All right, it's showtime. Good morning, Oslo. Yeah, I hit there, Dave Aronson. Oh, yeah, yeah. Har for a laridai. Oh, drepa on the mutanter. Mun, yeah, I come to the yard, po and yelsk. Mainly because you've just heard almost all the Norwegian I speak. Before we start, I think we need to level set some expectations. To call this an advanced talk is a little bit misleading, but to call it a beginner talk would be even more misleading. Even averaging them out as intermediate would still be misleading. What this is, is an introduction to an advanced technique. So if you're already well-versed in mutation testing, I won't be too offended if you go seek better learning opportunities elsewhere, but still I'd rather you stick around so you can correct my mistakes later in private. Before we get into killing evil mutants though, we have a lot of background questions to answer. For instance, what is an evil mutant anyway? What is a mutant, whether it's evil or not? What was it before it was mutated? How did it get mutated? How did it become evil? Or was it born evil? What's so evil about it? Why should we kill it? To misquote Rodney King, can't we all just get along? Long story short, these are all things from mutation testing, which I've only mentioned so far in passing. So let's start there. What on earth is mutation testing? In our universe, that of software development, not comic books, mutation testing is a software testing technique for ensuring that our code is meaningful so that any small change to it will result in a noticeable difference in the behavior and ensuring that our tests are strict so that it will indeed notice that change in the behavior, catch it, and fail. To unpack all that a little more, it helps us identify gaps in our test suite. Its primary purpose is to identify times when our test suite lets our code get away with unexpected behavior. It can also help us with our actual code. It can help us find unreachable or redundant or meaningless code that we can remove, eliminate, delete, or take out. It does all this by changing or mutating our code with the intention of creating faults. So it counts as a fault-based testing technique. In this respect, it is similar, well, at least related, to something you may already be familiar with, Chaos Monkey, developed and run by Netflix. Just like Chaos Monkey helps Netflix discover flaws in their error recovery process, mutation testing helps us discover flaws in our tests and, to our lesser extent, our actual production code. But the way mutation testing works is sort of upside down from what Chaos Monkey does. Chaos Monkey does a lot of things, but it's best known for injecting faults in mostly dropped connections into Netflix's production network. If all goes well, especially to the point where customers don't notice, then Netflix knows that their error recovery is working fine. Mutation testing, however, injects changes, not necessarily problems. It usually doesn't know whether these changes will actually create faults or not. It injects them into copies of our code, not our network. And it does its work in our test environment. Whew. And if all goes well, in the sense that our tests still pass, that does not mean that everything is fine. In fact, that's when we know we have a problem. If each change to our code makes at least one test fail, then we know that because there's a problem, we have no problem. In other words, our code is meaningful and our tests are strict. <laughs> 
But of course, it's not a silver bullet. We developers know there's no such thing. Besides which, those are for killing werewolves, not mutants. So yes, there are indeed some drawbacks. First, it's rather hard labor on our CPU, and therefore usually rather slow. We shouldn't expect it to run anywhere near as fast as, say, our usual unit test suite, or even common extra tools such as linters. We definitely won't want to run mutation testing against our entire unit test suite upon every saving of our code. A more appropriate use is to run it overnight, or at least over our lunch break. A fairly small system may finish mutation testing over a coffee break, or for those speaking British English, a T interval. Fortunately, most mutation testing tools include an incremental mode so that we can mutation test only what has changed since last time. That one we might be able to do on each save, or at least certainly more frequently than overnight. Also, its CPU intensive nature can really run up our bills on cloud platforms such as AWS or Azure or Azure or however you pronounce it. And some of you may be wondering why is it so CPU intensive? We'll get to that later when we look into how it works. Another drawback is that it is not at all a beginner friendly technique. It will tell us, for instance, that making some particular change to our code made no difference to our test suite. But what does that even mean? Unlike a regular test that will tell us that some result was correct or incorrect, it takes a lot of interpretation to figure out what an evil mutant is trying to tell us. Their accent is very strange, and they're almost as incoherent as zombies, but they have a much bigger vocabulary. They're not always on about brains. They're usually trying to tell us that our code is meaningless and our tests are lax, or both, but it can be very hard to figure that out, or to figure out exactly how. Even, <clears throat> even worse, sometimes it's a false alarm, and there's really nothing to worry about but we can spend a lot of time figuring that out. If you can't see the inscription clearly, this is a sand sculpture of the boy who cried wolf. Even aside from false alarms, there's normally a fair amount of code that we're not testing and probably shouldn't bother to test, like whether some particular string gets logged exactly correctly in debug mode. Sounds pretty crazy, huh? Where does this bizarro idea come from? Mutation testing has a surprisingly long history, at least in the context of computers. It was first proposed in 1971 in Richard Lipton's term paper titled Fault Diagnosis of Computer Programs. The first tool didn't even appear until nine years after that in 1980 as part of Timothy Budd's PhD work at Yale University. Even after that, it was still not really practical until fairly recently, maybe the last decade or two, with the advances in CPU speed, multi-core CPUs, and so forth. Since then, there has been a veritable explosion of academic research, tools, and actual usage. Now let's peel back one layer of the onion and look at how it works from a high-level view. First, our chosen tool will break apart our code into pieces to test. Usually these will be our functions or methods if we're using an object-oriented language. Sorry, object-oriented people, I'm just going to refer to functions and modules from here on rather than mentioning methods and classes and such. Anyway, at this point, some tools do things in a little different order, but most of them will go look for the tests for this particular function for each one. This is usually done by some kind of tagging 
and unfortunately that tagging is usually done manually. If it can't find any tests tagged for the current function, some tools will use the entire unit test suite, which is of course highly inefficient and leads to lots of false alarms. That's why most of them will just skip this function and go on to the next one. Now, assuming there are tests for the current function, the next step is to make the mutants. How does it do that? It looks at this particular function and for each tiny little way in which it can be changed. The mutation to testing tool makes a clone, not a mutant quite yet. But then it makes that one tiny little change to that one clone, and now we have a mutant. But it's not evil yet. We'll get to that later. Once our tool is done creating mutants for a given function, it iterates over the list of mutants. And now we get to the real core of it. For each mutant that it made from the current function, it will run the function's tests using that mutant instead of the original function until one of the tests fails. After that, it won't bother running any more against that one mutant. We don't care how many more it could make fail, just zero versus at least one. Now, if it gets through all of the tests, then we know have a pro we know we have a problem. But if at least one fails, that's called killing the mutant, and it's a good thing. It's exactly what we want. It means that our code is meaningful, that the tiny little change that the mutation testing tool made had a noticeable effect on the behavior, and our tests noticed and caught it and failed. Then the tool will move on to the next function, or if that was, excuse me, the next mutant from the same function, or if that was the last one, then move on to the next function. Uh, on a side note, if you object to the violent metaphor of killing the mutant, you can think of it like blessing the mutant to turn it into a good mutant, or maybe exiling it, or whatever. Anyway, that brings us back to the original question. If that's a good mutant, then what's an evil mutant? If a good mutant is one that makes at least one of our tests fail, then clearly an evil mutant is one that doesn't. In other words, makes our tests still pass. It's an evil mutant with the superpower of mimicry, at least good enough to fool our unit tests. So what's so evil about that? If a good mutant indicates that our code is meaningful and our tests are strict, then obviously an evil mutant means that our code is meaningless or redundant or unreachable or some other way not meaningful, and, or our tests are lax, or possibly both. Before we go any further, I mentioned that it makes one tiny little change to each mutant, and a common question is, why does it change it in only one way? There are several reasons. For one, it helps us poor, distractible humans focus. It's much easier to tell what an evil mutant is trying to tell us if we're only talking about one thing at a time. You can think of it like using the single responsibility principle, or at least just trying to do some work, focusing instead of multitasking. Don't distract yourself. Another reason is that multiple changes may cancel each other out. For instance, one change may increment something and another may decrement the same thing. This would lead to many more false alarms. It's times when the mutants doesn't make an actual test fail, but didn't make a significant difference in the code either. Lastly, allowing multiple mutations would lead to a combinatorial explosion of mutants, with the tool making many times more mutants per, mu uh, per function, which would make it even more CPU-intensive. And now it's time to 
tackle that question, which I deferred from earlier, why is it so CPU intensive? To answer that, we do need to crunch a few numbers, but don't worry, the math is pretty basic. Suppose we have a program made up of 10 modules, and each of those modules has 10 functions. Suppose each function has 10 lines, and each line has not 10, just five places where it can be changed. But at each of those points where it can be changed, we have 20 things we can change it to. That makes 100,000 mutants. And for each one of those, we'll probably need to run a few of our unit tests, possibly all the unit tests applicable to that function. Now, how many is that? Suppose each function has 10 tests. That's probably a little high, but that's still only a thousand tests in our entire unit test suite. With the numbers I gave before, mutation testing could easily wind up running a few hundred thousand tests. In other words, a few hundred times our whole unit test suite. And it'll therefore presumably take about a few hundred times as much CPU time and more importantly, elapsed time while we're sitting there waiting. Even if every single mutant fails the very first test we run against it, that's still a hundred thousand test runs or about a hundred times our unit test suite. If we suppose that our unit tests normally finish in a pretty zippy 10 seconds, that's still a thousand seconds, which is almost 17 minutes. But there is some hope. There is some good news. Over the past decade or so, there's been a lot of research on trimming down the number of mutants, mostly by weeding out those that are semantically equivalent to the original code, redundant with other mutants, or would create an obvious error condition. Uh, these things have sometimes cut the mutant horde by up to about two-thirds. But even with that much success in weeding them out, it's still no silver bullet, because this takes significant CPU time itself, and the remaining mutants are still quite a lot. Now that we know why it's so CPU intensive, let's get back a bit to why we only change it in one way. What would happen to that number of 100,000 mutants if we allowed two changes per, per mutant? For each original mutant with just one change, if we allowed two, we would have 49 choices of where to do another mutation within that same function, times 20 ways we could mutate at that place, and that works out to 980 new mutants for each old mutant. Of course, if you add in the old ones, we have a total of 981 times as many mutants as with only one. And if we started with 100,000, that means we now have over 98 million mutants. If we went further, and allowed three mutations per mutant. I'll spare you most of the math, but we wind up with... Oh, sorry, I forgot a bit. Uh, even if we weeded out two-thirds of them at each of those two mutations, we'd still have nearly 11 million mutants. If we allowed three mutations per mutant, I'll spare you most of the math, but we wind up with over 94 billion with a B mutants. And if we, even if we managed to weed out two thirds of them at each of the three steps, we would still have nearly three and a half billion. Now that's admittedly with the American way of naming these powers of a thousand. Oops. <laughs> Uh, oh, that's just blocked by the speaker. <laughs> okay. Uh, other countries have other ways of naming powers of a thousand, but 
Just look at those big numbers and you can tell. Never mind running the tests, just creating the mutants would get to be a huge workload. And we can avoid most of that workload and the lack of focus and the drastically increased false alarms if we just limit it to one mutation per mutant. Now let's peel back another layer of the onion and look at the technical details of how this works. First, our mutation testing tool parses our code into an abstract syntax tree, or AST. A quick recap for those of you who might not have dealt with ASTs for a while. It's a tree structure that represents our code. And each node is either an operation or a level of structure. So its children is either its operands or its contents. For instance, the code on the left side there would be parsed into the tree on the right side. I know those boxes may be a little small to read clearly, but we don't need to understand this particular one in much detail. Anyway, then our testing tool walks through the tree, copying out subtrees or branches, if you will, that represent our functions. To mutate that smaller chunk of AST representing one function, it then walks through that subtree just like it did for the whole thing. However, now, instead of looking for subtrees it can extract, it's looking for nodes where it can change something. And each time it finds one, it makes further copies of the current function subtree, that whole thing, changed in each way that it can change that node. For instance, suppose that our tool has walked down this tree to that not equal comparison following those bold red arrows. For each way it could change that not equal comparison, it would make a fresh copy of that whole subtree with only that node changed in only that way. After it's done making as many mutants as it possibly can from that one node, it'll continue down the tree, following, for instance, possibly this new arrow to that comparison's first operand. Again, for each way it could change that node, it'll make a fresh copy of that whole tree with that node changed that way, blah, blah, blah. So what kind of changes can it make? There are many, many kinds, usually replacing something or removing something, possibly adding a unary operator, such as a logical or arithmetic negation. For instance, it can change a mathematical operator from one to another, such as changing x plus y to x minus y times y divided by y or to the power of y. If the language allows, it could even change it to a logical or bitwise operator. If the order of operands matters, such as with subtraction, division, or exponentiation, it can swap them. It can change a comparison from one to another. For instance, when we were back in that uh, AST graph, when it was at the comparison, it could have changed uh, to any of these other types of comparisons. It can change a logical operator from one to another or insert or remove a negation. It can change a numeric constant or variable to some other numeric constant or to something of an entirely different type, like an object or to quote Smeagol, string or nothing. Of course, it could do likewise with strings and pretty much any other type including possibly substituting much longer strings that I could show here. Maybe even trying to overflow some buffers so you get some fuzz testing in there as well. Entire lines of code can simply be removed. It could negate or substitute some constant for a mathematical expression or a function call. Function calls can also get their arguments scrambled or removed. Function declarations can have their uh, contents mutated, of course, but they can also have their argument declaration lists mutated. Uh, 
such as having some removed or swapped. It can have the entire body removed and replaced by returning a constant or an expression or raising a deliberate error, or if the language permits, replaced by nothing at all. It can remove a condition so that something the, the program might normally skip over is always done. It can remove a loop control so that something the program might do once, do multiple times, or skip is always done once. There are many, many more such substitutions it can make, but I think you get the idea. Now let's finally walk through some examples. Suppose we have a function like so. Now I want you to think about what a mutation testing tool could make out of a function like this. Mostly it could produce mutants that in effect would return results such as any of these expressions or constants and many, many more. Now suppose we had only one test like so. In other words, assert that two to the power of two equals four. And I bet many of you have already figured out where this is going because that is a spectacularly bad test. Even so though, most of those mutants I just showed would still get killed by this test. In particular, the, those shown here crossed out in green. The ones returning constants won't match. Subtraction gets us zero, dividing gets us one, and returning either argument alone gets us two. And of course, the ones creating a deliberate error condition will at least make the test not pass. But addition, sub multiplication, and exponentiation in the reverse order all still get us the correct answer. So they are evil mutants. Also note that exponentiation in the reverse order can happen in at least two different ways. And I'll show you that in a moment. When we run our mutation testing tool, it should give us a report that would boil down to something like this. The exact words, amount of context, and so forth will depend on exactly which tool we use, but the information should be pretty much the same. To unpack it a bit, it's saying that if we change the function called power, which is in the file demo.p starting at line one, to swap, <clears throat> excuse me, to change line one to swap the order of the arguments or to change line two to change the exponentiation to addition or multiplication or exponentiation in the reverse order, we'd still get the right answer. Note also that the first and last mutants are the ones that make exponentiation happen in the reverse order and that if we allowed two mutations per mutant, those two would cancel out. So what is this mutant trying to tell us? The very high level message is that our test suite is just not sufficient. Either there are not enough tests or the ones we have, or in this case, the one we have are not very good, but we knew that. Now, does anybody have any suggestions how to kill these evil mutants? Well, no one rid me of these troublesome mutants. Write additional tests. Yes, that's one way we could do it. Or we could change it. Oh, I see uh, another hand there. Yes. Use other operands like three and five. Well, I think two and three will also do just fine. Yes, we could also add them as an additional test. But if we want to keep our test suite nice and tight, just changing the one we have would at least be more efficient. So in other words, assert that two cubed is eight, fine. And that would fix all of them since all the previously surviving mutants would now return different answers. All the ones that are old test killed would still die 
Uh, exponentiation in the reverse order would give us 9, of course. Addition would give us 5. Multiplication would give us 6. And now the correct operation is the only one, well, the only common simple one anyway, that will return the correct answer of 8. Now this may make mutation testing sound very simple, but of course this is a downright trivial example. The mutated line is a simple mathematical expression, so it's pretty easy to think up different parameters that would make the tests return different results. So now let's look at a more complex example. Suppose we have a function to send a message, like so. This naively tries to send out the next chunk of a message, as much of it as it can, over and over, until the message is completely sent. A mutation testing tool can, of course, make lots and lots of mutants from something like this. But one I want to look at first is this. The minus sign, I forgot to explain before, means lines are removed. You've probably seen diffs in a format like that. So this is an example of removing a loop control so that the chunk inside the loop is always done once. In other words, it's equivalent to this, which is the original code with the looping removed. Now let's assume that this mutant survives our test suite. In other words, it's evil. What is that telling us? Anybody? If a mutant that only goes through that loop body once acts the same as our normal code, as far as our unit tests can tell, then our unit tests are only making that code go through that loop body once as well. In other words, we're not testing sending a message big enough to make that loop execute multiple times, which in turn means we're not testing sending a, a larger message than send bytes can handle in one shot. This could be from a number of different causes, but the obvious one is that we're simply using too small a message. Suppose module message defines the largest chunk that send bytes can handle, and that's 10,000 bytes. But as we see in test send message, we're only sending three bytes. That's nowhere near the limit. Mm. So what can we do about that? The obvious fix is to send a much larger message, either adding a test or changing the one we already have. And to refresh your memory, large enough means larger than max chunk size, and that's why we are adding one to it to make our message size there. So this revised version of test send message should make that loop go at least once, I mean, excuse me, at least twice. But suppose, to paraphrase Shakespeare, the fault, dear Oslo, is not in our tests, but in our code that this mutant is evil. Perhaps we did try sending a larger message, uh, uh, suppose we did try sending the largest permissible message out of a set of predefined messages, or at least message sizes, as we see here. See, we have small, medium, and large messages, and we tested sending a large, and yet this mutant is still evil. What could possibly be wrong with that? It's trying to tell us that a version with the looping removed and all the other stuff we need to support it will do the job just fine. And that boils down to this. And now it's pretty clear that what it's really trying to tell us is that the entire send message function may be redundant. So we can just get rid of it and use send bytes directly. Now in real world code, there may be some error handling or logging or whatever that we should still do. So we can't entirely get rid of send message, but at least the looping and everything else to support that is redundant. 
Now we've seen how to kill a couple normal kinds of mutants. But what about immortal mutants? I hear a chuckle of recognition there. Norwegian metalheads might recognize that guy. He's in a band out of Trondheim called Immortal. So of course I couldn't resist using that slide. It took a while to find one labeled for reuse. Anyway, what do I even mean by immortal mutants? I mean ones that, unless we take special measures, will go on forever. Let's take a look at another mutant that could be generated from send message. Instead of looping, instead of removing the loop control, what if we removed the line that makes the loop ever end? This mutant, by not incrementing bytes sent, would loop forever, sending the initial chunk of the message over and over, assuming, of course, the size was greater than zero in the first place. So how do we kill a mutant like that? With some tools, we're in luck and we don't have to do it ourselves. Some of them will automatically terminate any mutant that lives for more than some amount of time, like a small fraction of a second. But some of them don't, so we're stuck killing them ourselves. How can we do this? Depending upon the language and the testing framework and other facilities available, we might be able to make our own timeout test, like this. If you're not used to this style of testing and error recovery, what this is, is saying is call send message with foo and three, and if that runs more than a tenth of a second, that's the 0 0.1 up there, raise a timeout error. If we do get a timeout error, catch it and assert false to deliberately fail the test with that message. If we don't get any error, then proceed on to assert true and pass the test. If it gets some other kind of error, well, we're not catching it. So handle it the usual way, which usually means blow up and fail the test. However, even that won't work if the code we're testing catches timeout errors itself, like this enhanced version of send message to include some of that error recovery, at least represented by a comment, that I alluded to earlier. Now, sorry, I don't know of a reliable, easy, general technique to kill mutants like that, but we could go to some lengths, like explicitly raise a different error and handle it, or run it in a separate process or thread, some tools already do that. And that gives us a lot more ways to poke at it and terminate it. But sometimes evil mutants, even immortal ones, really are just random. Some tools give you ways to mark certain lines or even entire functions as non-mutatable or even non-mutatable in certain ways. So if you're using a tool like that, I would recommend whitelisting that line that was removed. At least tell it, don't remove this. Like leaving a note on the whiteboard, do not erase. In summary, mutation testing is a powerful technique to ensure that our code is meaningful and our tests are strict. It's easy to get started with, at least in terms of setting up the tools and tagging our tests. Yes, it may be rather tedious, but at least it's conceptually easy. But it's rather difficult to interpret the results, and it's quite hard labor on the CPU, even if these factors mean it's not really an appropriate thing for your current projects. At least it's still a really cool idea, at least in a kind of geeky way. If you'd like to try mutation testing for yourself, here's a list of tools for some common languages and some others, like I, I doubt many of you are doing Fortran 77 these days. I'll pause a minute so you can take pictures, as I see many of you are already doing.
Okay, I think all the photographers are done. And now it's your turn. If you have any questions on killing evil mutants, I'll take them now, and then we can open it up to more general questions and comments and such. If you think of something later, well, my contact information is up there, and I'll be around for the rest of the conference, including the cruise tonight. But first, a shout out to TopTal, whose speakers network helped me prepare and practice this presentation. Please use that referral link if you want to hire us or join us. Any questions? Okay, the question, if I understand correctly, is in that example with the small, medium, and large message sizes, there we go, are there tools that would recognize one test that would that we could feed all of the message sizes and test each one and not make separate mutants out of them. Is that close to what you mean? No, I mean, I mean <laughs> if you have data-driven tests, like a theory or stuff, and you would just have one test method as such, mm -hmm. but you feed in tests that would simply just um, loop once and loop many times, you explicitly wanted to test all these variations, but in this case, it would still um, show you an evil mutant for the test where you just have a small message. But would that mean you would try to avoid running this test method with a parameter set that only loops once? Okay. Let me try again to paraphrase that and see if I understand. With a data-driven test, so that you're looping over these message sizes and testing proper functionality with each one, that particular mutant would still be evil with each of the sizes. So would it, you know, would at least some of the typical mutation testing tools realize that for one of the sizes and not bother testing with the other sizes. Is that what you mean? No, what I meant was <laughs> it would fail for one, for one parameter set, but it will succeed for the others. Ah, okay, if it will fail for one and succeed for the others. Hmm. Okay, such as in this case, if we're trying to test okay the test itself is testing that we get back the actual size and if that would fail for the large one i think that's a complex enough question that i think we're going to have to hash that over separately and not take time from others who may be asking quicker questions, unless, of course, there are no other quicker questions. Um, anybody else have questions? I hear, see a hand raised there, or you're just scratching your head. Is it expensive to what? Ah, yes, it usually takes a fair amount of time in practice. I have done this mainly in Ruby and mainly on uh, fairly small machines, but still with a fairly small system. And even so, it still took about an hour and a half to generate a, a full mutation testing run against uh, the test suite we had at the time, which is not too extensive. I'm trying to fix that, but that's a whole other story. So it can be expensive in the computer terms. 
So uh, meaning the CPU time and elapsed time. Yes, it's one of the major drawbacks. But if you can let it run overnight and then manually go through the tests and weed out a lot of the ones that are trying to tell you the same thing, um, it can still be reasonable. Yes. Uh, do the tools generally support some tagging of your source code? Because, I mean, whereas once you realize, okay, these aren't really problems. Can you sort of tag your code with some comments or something? Yes. Uh, a lot of them, unfortunately not quite all of them, will let you tell the mutation testing tool, don't bother with this line. I know this is going to yield a lot of false alarms. Or some of them give you a little more fine-grained control, like don't bother making uh, this plus into a minus or whatever. Uh, don't mutate it in these particular ways. Uh, sometimes that can get rather hairy to figure out, especially if you then change the line itself. You then have to figure out, is there still uh, a high potential for false alarms there. You could just untag it and see what the tool spits out. And if there's still uh, a high rate of false alarms or if there's an even worse rate of false alarms, yes, tag it appropriately. Maybe just mutate the comment so that the tool won't recognize it or something. Yes, the constants are subject to mutation. Uh, for instance, let's see, I think I had some in there. Do, 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 do. Yeah, uh, if you were using number 42, so if you had something like x equals y over 42, uh, it could change it to y over minus 42 or y over minus one, y over zero. Of course, you get a division by zero error there. Or do you mean when you're declaring a constant, so have like uh, pi equals 3.14, it could change that to zero. With uh, numeric values, there are much more variants in these Mm-hmm. So maybe this list is absolutely not complete. <laughs> Yes, uh, there's many, many more substitutions that these things can make. Uh, if I had the entire list on one slide, it would be too small to easily read, but I think this gives you the, the general idea. It can mess with your constants. Uh, the enemy of what? CPU. CPU. Uh, the enemy of CPU. Interesting concept. Um, hmm. I don't think it necessarily has to be a constant. Anything you put there, even if it was like x equals y over z, each of those would still get mutated. Uh, well, at least the x might not get mutated, but the y and the over and the z. So I could change it to all sorts of things like x equals 42 over z or z over 40, well, or y over 42 or y times z and so forth. Yes. So is it worth it? Do you find actual bugs in the code? <laughs> I have found a few places where the code was unreachable and somewhere it was not doing quite what I thought it was doing. So yes, it, it's helpful. Whether it is worth it, well, that's much more of a judgment call. You may find that it's, at least certainly at first, before you really get a feel for what it's trying to tell you, you might find that it's a royal pain in the proverbial posterior and you're not finding significant problems, but if you do a little bit once in a while, yeah. I yes. 
boundary condition. I mean, if you could mm -hmm. select only to do things like that, at least it would show you that you really didn't test at the boundaries on loop or something. Yes, uh, testing. Uh, if it comes up with mutants like uh, strictly less than is an evil mutant substituting in for less than or equal to or vice versa, yes, that will point out boundaries that you did not hone in on, home in on to test. I see a hand back there, yes. So, see when you're doing the, the mutants, um, when you get a bunch of bad mutants back and you rerun it again, mm -hmm. does it know the previous bad mutants? Okay, some of the tools will do that. Uh, a lot of them include an incremental mode so that it will test only what changed and it'll have some temporary file or whatever where it writes down, okay, this file was written on this date and time and had these evil mutants in it and it will then see okay it hasn't changed since then so eh, don't bother testing it yes you, you uh, talked about uh, tagging uh, certain uh, statements that uh, shouldn't be mutated mm -hmm. Yes, in the source code. It's, it's kind of like annotations you have in uh, several languages. Like, uh, I understand this is a heavily Microsoft-oriented uh, conference, but uh, I don't know that stack very well. I know those sort of notations are often used in Java and in some modern varieties of JavaScript. Yes, you can have a lot of comments that are just for the purpose of getting rid of false alarm evil mutants, just getting in the way of code legibility. Yes, that is a drawback that I should mention in the in the next edition of this talk. Yes, if you have a lot of false alarms that you want to get rid of through tagging, some of them you can get rid of by rearranging your code a little bit. Sometimes it's you know, not a false alarm at all. But yes, if you don't want it to bother testing, testing that, for instance, some particular string gets logged correctly in debug mode, um, yeah, that's a good application for... Uh, whitelisting or at least saying do not remove, do not mutate in various ways this particular line. Uh, yeah, at least have attributes on an assembly level that you have it somewhere in your test suite and not have it in production code. Hmm. Uh, the question is, I realize I've been forgetting to repeat the questions. Uh, could you at least have such a list in the I don't recall exactly what words you use, but I assume you mean basically the tool configuration, <laughs> telling it uh, don't bother mutating calls to this function or something like that, right? Yeah, more in the test environment rather than in the production wherever. Ah, okay, in the Could test rather than the... Test yeah. library as a top level list of exclusion or exemptions you don't want to have considered anymore. Yeah, I have not seen ones that, well, then again, I have not used all of the tools. I've used uh, mostly Mutant for Ruby and a little bit of Mutt Mutt for Python. Played a tiny bit with others, but I have not seen any that will let you put such configuration in the tests themselves. But most of them do take a fairly extensive configuration file, so they could have... Uh, at least that way of accepting a list of functions not to bother mutating calls to rather than littering up your production code. Yeah. 
function like divide, and as you mentioned before, divide by zero is not possible. Let's say I have two unit tests, one for checking a precondition check, that if I pass zero, I get an argument, argument exception, and another unit test that's testing the proper divide operation. Of course, if I manipulate both, I can, can get even meter for either of those two operations, but of course, I don't want to have just a single unit test. Right. If I consider I have two tests, and it will only expect that one of those two tests is um, failing. Ah, it will use all the tests that you have tagged as being applicable to that particular function. So uh, if you have your divide function and your divide by zero gets us an exception test and a nine divided by three gets us, well, okay, let's say 12 divided by three gets us four test. Uh, it would run both of those if the mutant survives. Uh, you don't want it to survive, but uh, it would run, well, some of them will do them in random order, some will do them in order of the file, whatever, but it'll run one. If it fails, it will just stop there. If it still succeeds, it'll go on to the next one. And once it's passed all the tests that are applicable to that function, if it passes them all, it'll be reported as an evil mutant. Yes. expecting it to just crash. So it would actually be an evil mutant, even if it throws an exception. Right. Um, if I can try and paraphrase the question, if you have a test that is actually expecting an exception to be thrown, then if an evil mutant is throwing an exception, it may be throwing the same exception but still due to a difference in the code. And I guess the point is that might essentially constitute a false alarm, right? No, actually the other way around. I mean, ah, okay. So. You have a, a division by zero exception, but uh, you would actually prefer that you can get a division by zero exception, but have trouble uh, error handling of the input. So that a division by zero exception Okay, so if your actual production code is catching those errors, that gets back to the stuff I was talking about with the uh, evil mutants that actually catch whatever error it is you're trying to construct. With a division by zero error, I suppose you could... No, I don't know offhand. I, I think I'll have to think about that a little more and get with you afterwards. And we have uh, a minute and a few seconds left in this session. So I guess we should probably continue this afterwards. And okay, do you have something that can be answered in less than a minute? How do, what's the mechanism for removing uh, meaningless mutations? Removing what? Ah, for removing the meaningless mutations, like the ones that are redundant with other mutants or semantically or is identical to the original code. Uh, I have not actually delved into how those actually work. So, I don't know. Yeah, I, I can research that for maybe the next edition of this talk. And with that, we are within 30 seconds of stop time. So thank you and... See you around. Mm -hmm.